It's time to sit back and relax and share with you a few of the experiences I've had as a realtor. Story time. It's The Real Estate Show. Welcome to The Real Estate Show. My name is Rick Naples. I am the owner broker of Zone Realty LLC. You zone your home. This show I'm calling Storytime. I wanted to just basically tell you a few little experiences that I've had over the years as a realtor here in the state of Connecticut. You know, a lot of realtors that are out there that have been in the business as long as I have have stories to tell, different experiences that they've had different situations they've been in. And it's always interesting to talk to them, as well as for me to recall some of the situations I found myself in. This first story that I want to share with you is kind of, well, it's a continuation of a story I told on a previous real estate show, but I wanted to share a little bit more details. It was back a number of years, and I was a relatively newer agent and then had an opportunity to sell a home in a town that I really wasn't familiar with. But all in all, the house did sell. But as we were getting to that sale, I had to do the different things that realtors do. Now one of the things that I did at this particular household is I held an open house. And open houses, as you know, are when the realtor opens the house for a couple of hours on a Saturday or a Sunday or a weeknight or whatever it might be and just invites potential people to come in and take a look and see what the home has to offer. Now this seller had been in this house for a while and unfortunately had gone through some bad times and the house wasn't all in that great a shape but it, it was okay. What was really appealing about this house was the location. It was on a beautiful lot of land with wonderful views. So I knew it was going to sell relatively quickly. Now living in this house was not only the owner, but his dog. <laughs> the dog was an older dog. She was very sweet. She would kind of, you know, wander around the yard and, and kind of lay down under the tree in the front little island. He had one of those little flowered islands with some bushes in the front yard. And mind her own business. She didn't bark. She was a very calm, older dog. So every time I would show up to either show the house or do an open house, the dog would basically come and greet me, wag her tail a little bit, and when I would sit in the kitchen waiting, you know, for the open house for people to come by and greet them, the dog would basically cuddle up right near my feet and keep me company. She was not a difficult animal, was very pleasant. If somebody came in to look at the house, she would kind of acknowledge them a little bit, wag her tail, but she was an older dog. She really wouldn't get up and bother anybody. Now, the owner had told me that the dog had lived with him for many, many years, and this was a home that the dog he was very familiar with. She was kind of the queen of the yard, um, and she was a good dog. She stayed within the yard. She never went outside the boundaries, maybe a little bit into the woods, but, you know, she pretty much stayed within the boundaries. And she was smart enough to know that they lived on a busy street, and there were a lot of cars, and, you know, stay away from the road, and she did that. He never had to worry about it. Well, we went on and we did a few open houses and we had a few showings and then we got an offer on the home that the seller accepted. And everything was going fine. The home inspection went well, the appraisal came in where it needed to come in, the paperwork was flowing wonderfully, the buyer was ready to close, the seller had made arrangements to, to have another place to go. Everything was wonderful. It was almost textbook. We were about two days before the closing when the dog, for some reason or another, decided when she went out into the yard to go out past the end of the driveway and out into the street. 
The dog had never done that before. The seller was adamant in telling me she never goes out into the street. But for one reason or another, the dog went out to the street. And unfortunately, when she was out at the street, it was dusk, a car came over the hill, didn't see the dog, the dog didn't see the car, and leads to say um, she was hit and she was killed. The owner was very grief stricken and really didn't know really what to do. I mean, when you have a member of a family like that, a pet, as you know, uh, which is accidentally killed or even passes from natural causes, it's devastating. He didn't know what to do. So instead of calling the vet or calling the police or, or making arrangements to, to have his dog taken care of, he picked her up and he brought her back into the yard and he laid her down under the bushes that she often laid under to enjoy the sun uh, in the front yard. And he decided that this will be her final resting place. So he dug a grave and he buried his dog with all honors, all emotions, in the front island where she always laid to enjoy the sun for the many years that they were together in the home. We're now a day away from the closing. And I get a call from my seller telling me what happened. And of course, I gave him my condolences and, and told him how sorry I was because I had gotten to know the dog. So I kind of felt that it was a loss for me too. And then he tells me that he didn't really know what to do with her, so he buried her in the front lawn. Well, that causes a problem. <laughs> See, as a realtor, if we become aware of something, um, we, our fiduciary responsibilities usually require us to disclose that to the buyer or to the buyer's agent. There are certain things we, by law, do not have to disclose. But in this case, this was something that I became knowledgeable about and I needed to disclose it. So we went to the closing. We're sitting at the closing table. Um, and I asked to speak to the attorney in confidentiality before we finished the closing. So I went out into the hallway uh, with my seller's attorney, with the buyer's attorney, and with the buyer. And I explained to them what had happened and that there is a dog buried in the front yard of the home that we're about to close on. I was pleasantly surprised that the buyer's reaction was not one of disgust or you know negativity. It was a very positive reaction. He basically said to me, no, that's fine. Um, she can stay there. Uh, I'm comfortable with it. It was her island. Let her rest in peace. And we went forward and we closed and everybody walked away from the table satisfied and the buyer subsequently moved into the home. This next story I want to share is about aggressiveness and how aggressive some buyers can be where they'll take some extreme risks in order to make the home theirs. I had a house that I listed and this house had a challenge. It had an underground oil tank and as you know underground oil tanks need to be removed and insurance companies won't put a homeowner's policy on a house if it has an underground oil tank. So we had a standstill. Um, an offer was made on the house. My seller accepted that offer. But the caveat was the oil tank had to be removed before the closing in order for the buyer to get insurance. The seller was not in a financial position to be able to afford to have that tank removed or subsequently replace it with a new tank. Surprising to everyone, the buyer decided to foot the cost on their own. Now this is a risky situation. You see, the buyer doesn't own the home. The seller hasn't closed on the home and the title has not transferred. Yet the buyer wants this house so badly, they were willing to spend the money 
to have the oil tank removed and a new oil system installed before the closing, paying for it all on their own. I thought this was quite unusual. Even the attorneys weren't comfortable with this because there's all kinds of risks. You know, what if the tank comes out of the ground and had leaked into the ground and now there's soil abatement that needs to be done and that's going to be thousands of dollars and, you know, the buyer's putting themselves at a huge, huge risk. Well, long story short, we went to the home, we watched the company pull the tank out, and luckily it came out in one piece. There was no soil damage, there was no, um, you know, no oil leaks or whatever it might be. Um, they took it out with no issues, they installed a new oil tank, uh, got everything working, and we subsequently, the next week, he, the buyer was able to get his insurance and we were able to close on the home. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but in this case, this buyer really wanted this house and felt that it was worth spending the money. They figured they would have to do it anyway, so they did it, and we closed, and we were all great. Now, I just told you two stories about situations where we thought the house wasn't going to close because of what had happened. But they both closed, and the buyers, as far as I know, are still in those homes, and they're very happy with their houses. But what happens if a closing falls apart? This story I want to tell you about is an interesting one because it involved multiple people. First of all, this was a multi-family home a number of years ago. It was a three-family. It had a two-bedroom uh, apartment on the first floor, and the second floor was split into two separate one-bedroom apartments. The building was completely occupied at the time that my buyers looked at it, and it was going to be their first investment property. Now, this was a situation where it was multiple people pulling their funds together to buy an investment property, and it was basically brothers and sisters getting together to do this. So everything seemed to be fine. We had an inspection, the inspection went fine, and the inspection, of course, is a little more involved because you've got three different units to inspect instead of one, like normal. And we thought everything was good. Again, we seemed to be okay. Everything was kind of chugging along the way it was supposed to when we were heading to the closing. And the day before the closing, the selling agent tells me that the tenant on the first floor has not paid their rent in six months. And that the seller has not started an eviction process because they figured they're selling the house. Let the buyer worry about it. Again, this puts me in a position, uh, you know, I've got to let the buyer know. I can't let the buyer go ahead and purchase this home with a tenant that hasn't paid rent on the first floor and maybe getting involved in an eviction. We're at the closing. We're literally at the closing table. And I had made the seller's attorney and the buyer's attorney, you know, everybody was aware, as far as the attorneys were concerned, of what the situation was. So the buyer's attorney asked the seller's attorney and the seller to leave the room. And I sat there with my buyer's attorney and my buyer, it's the whole group of them, and the buyer's attorney explained what the situation was. The buyer's attorney also gave the buyers alternatives on what they could do, you know, besides starting an eviction process and getting the first floor tenant out of the property. Well, remember, this is the first investment property these buyers are going to buy. So they were kind of nervous about the process to begin with. So what happened was, of the group of people that were buying the house, most of them were okay with the idea of an eviction process and escrowing several months rent, including the back rent, so that they were solvent going forward, closing on the property. But one of the buyers was nervous that this tenant might, once the eviction process was started, decide to destroy the place. Now, it turns out that two of the people, the people that were buying this property, happened to be in the construction business, so 
They said, let them destroy it. Uh, we're going to remodel it anyways. So it's great. You know, if they want to bash holes in the wall and smash the toilets and the sinks or whatever, go ahead. Let them do it. We're going to replace all that stuff. But one of the buyers in the group felt it was just too high of a risk. And because of that, the buyers basically stood up from the closing table and left. Now I'm sitting there. Seller's out in the hallway, seller's attorney's out in the hallway, buyer's attorney's sitting in the room with me. We had to have the seller come back in and the seller's attorney come back in and basically say, buyers have left, they're not going to close. So the deal blew up right then and there. Was it ever salvaged? I mean, did they evict that tenant and did the buyer come back and decide they wanted to move forward with it? Nope. So it was a lost deal. Unusual, but it happens. First time buyers are always fun to work with um, because they're almost like little kids. Uh, you know, when you're buying your first home, there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of emotions, there's a lot of you know, hesitation. What, what do we do? How do we do it? What can we expect? All those different things that run through your mind. Usually when I work with a buyer, after the, we've gone through you know, the process of getting them pre-qualified or pre-approved or finding what their situation is, we start to go out and we look at homes. And one of the things that I like to do is I like to sit a buyer down first in my office or at a coffee shop or whatever and do what's called a buyer's interview. In other words, really get to know what it is they're looking for. And you're talking about the house, you know, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, garage, size yard, location, you know, all those kinds of things. But sometimes you forget to ask some of the might be called personal questions. And, and I'm not talking about invading somebody's privacy, but questions like, um, you know, what are your intentions when you get into the house? You know, maybe I can help refer someone as far as electricians or plumbers are concerned. Um, but I don't really ask about phobias. You know, some people will not buy a house if a smoker lives in the house. Some people won't buy a house with a fireplace because they just don't like the smell of smoke. That's a viable question for a realtor to ask so you don't go showing them houses that maybe a smoker will. I had a buyer at one time that was scared to death of dogs. So we steered away from looking at houses with dogs. She wouldn't even go look at a house where the seller took the dog out of the house and the dog was not there. She felt, has a dog, dog lives there, want nothing to do with the property. Okay, well that's fine. In this particular situation, my first time buyer, we hadn't had that conversation. So we went to look at a house and everything was great. This was a nice little Cape Cod had everything she was looking for, it was in the right location, um, she couldn't have asked for more. And we went through the whole house and the only place that we had left to look at was the basement. And we had known from the data description that the basement was a finished basement and there was a family room down there and an extra bathroom. So she was kind of anxious to go downstairs and take a look at it. So as a rule, Usually realtors will not go into attics or basements unless they have a really good relationship with their buyers. So they usually tell the buyer, you know, you go down, you look, and then come on back upstairs um, and we'll discuss it. In this particular case, um, I had just started with this particular buyer, so I decided to let her go down in the basement and take a look and look around and then come on back upstairs and we'll discuss, you know, what she saw and go from there. So she starts going down the stairs to the basement. All of a sudden I hear a scream. It wasn't a blood curling scream, but it was a scream, enough to startle me. And my buyer comes tearing up the stairs and runs right out of the house. Didn't even acknowledge me. Just up the stairs and out of the house. And I'm thinking, whoa, what, 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 huh, what? So, of course, I went out. And she's standing near her car and she's practically in tears. She's shaking. And I said to her, what's the matter? What's the matter? She said, you won't believe what's down in that basement. 
And I said, well, tell me. She said, you've got to go look yourself. Okay. So, of course, now I go back into the house, and I'm going to go down in the basement. And I'm a little bit apprehensive because my buyer just ran out of the house screaming. What am I going to find? What's going to be down there? Now, this is the type of house where the stairs go down, and then they take a 180-degree turn. They go down to a little stop platform, they turn, and then they turn again. So I go down the stairs to the first platform. I'm very cautious. I turn, and as soon as I face the direction to go down the final three stairs, right there on the wall, directly across from me, is a stuffed bear head. It turns out that the owner of this house was a hunter and used the basement to display his trophies. So the basement was filled with some deer heads, a bear head, you know, some stuffed smaller animals. There was even a goose. Well, that's what freaked out the buyer. So, of course, I went back upstairs. I was very apologetic. But had I asked in that buyer interview if there were any phobias and I reached a little further, maybe I would not have decided to show that house. Although, in all fairness, the realtor that listed the house made no mention of that in the data. So sometimes when you go to look at homes, folks, there might be some things that could be a surprise. This final story is a real quick one. It's about a septic tank. You know, as a new realtor, sometimes you want to go out and you want to see things and you want to explore things and learn things. You know, it's your opportunity. I sold a house once and uh, I had never been to a septic inspection. I wanted to see what it was all about. So we went and we're watching the, the septic guy, you know, find the lid and open up the septic tank. And I decided, you know, that's pretty cool. There's a hole in the ground. It's kind of cool. I think I want to go over and take a look down in the hole, see what, see what it looks like. You know, I'm curious. So I walked over to the hole. And of course, septic tanks have a certain uh, aroma to them, you might say. So of course, I, when I bent over to take a look down the tank, I was hit directly in the face with that aroma. And needless to say, um, I had just come from a luncheon meeting, so I quite honestly had to excuse myself and uh, ended up buying a new pair of shoes. <laughs> this has been The Real Estate Show. I thank you very much for watching. My name is Rick Naples. I'll see you next time. special guest, Dr. Andrew Lynn. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Veterans Corner. My name is Chuck Wooden. Decision for ourselves for this week, if we want to be made well. Hi, welcome to the crack of dawn. It's Dawn Lombardi. I'm starting the painting. It's going to be the clips with some water. Love it. He took me on the sets of Lost in Space, Batman. Everybody has a story. What's yours? Until next time.